we have two very distinguished speakers who are recently returned from northern Iraq to report on what they have seen there. And they have slides on, on what they have seen. And the first speaker is well known to all of you, Congressman Frank Wolf, who is a champion on the issue of the right to religious freedom and the right to conscience, who sponsored during his 17 terms in Congress uh, so much legislation on this issue, including uh, the very well-known act on religious freedom. He is currently occupying the Wilson Chair in Religious Freedom at Baylor University and has joined the 21st Century Wilberforce Initiative as a distinguished senior fellow. I invite you to Frank's article in, uh, at Wilberforce on their website, Speak Freedom Alert, that has a title that tells you a lot, The Unliberated Liberated in Iraq. I'm sure he'll tell us more about that uh, during his remarks. Now, our second speaker is David Eubank, who's a former US Army Ranger and Special Forces officer and the founder of the Free Burma Rangers. There's plenty of literature from Dave out on a table on his group, and there is Wilberforce literature also out there, I believe, Frank, to talk about uh, what you are doing there. Now, I won't uh, spend any further time since we do have two speakers, so please join me in welcoming, welcoming them as they address the topic of End of Christianity in the Cradle of Christendom, a report from northern Iraq after ISIS. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Wolf. Well, thank you very much. I want to begin by thanking uh, Bob Riley and Westminster for having this event. And Bob has been a big supporter when we brought Sister Diana over. Bob helped with housing, and so I want to thank you for all, all of the efforts. Also, I want to thank Randall Everett. Is Randall here? Randall Everett, who is the president of the 21st Century Wilberforce, the group that I work for. Randall was the one who got us started on this effort because when I joined, uh, he decided to take our group. We went to uh, this region in, in January of 2015, so I thank uh, Randall for that effort and for the work he's done with regard to the 21st century Wilberforce group, working on this and on Nigeria and, and many other areas. As we all know, uh, the Congress, the House and Senate, called this genocide. It was a unanimous vote. There were no negative votes. And shortly thereafter, to his credit, uh, Secretary Kerry then called it a gen genocide. The statement that Secretary Tillerson made yesterday was very powerful. There was no if or buts. He called it genocide for both Christians Yazidis and others, and laid out, I think, a very good program. And so let me just thank Secretary Tillerson for the, his speech yesterday, bringing this administration on the same page with regard to what's taking place with Christians and Yazidis and, and others. There's more biblical activity that's taken place in Iraq than any other country of the world other than Israel. Uh, my first trip there was in 2003. We were in, in a town called Nasiriyah. The Marines said, have you been to this spot? And they took me to Ur, Ur, when they said, this was David's village. And I climbed the ziggurat, which is 2,200 years B B.C. Abraham's from there. Ezekiel is buried there. Jacob uh, spent 20 years. The, the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel were all, all born, born there. Daniel lived in Babylon for his whole life. Anne is buried there, Ezekiel is buried there, Nahum is buried there, Isis blew up Jonah's tomb. Everywhere we went on this trip, we saw biblical activity. So there's more biblical activity there than almost any other country of the world other than is Israel. In 2003, there were one and a half million Christians. One and a half million, million Christians. Today, the number is 200, 250,000, maybe 300,000. And two people we spoke to said it may actually be as low as, a, as 150,000. Many or most have, have left. Those who remain are in sometimes involuntary nomads in their own land. They want to stay. They're looking for the West to sort of embrace them, to speak out. 
and yet they really haven't seen the church in the West, nor they have seen the Western governments really put their money, if you will, where their mouth is. Rhetoric and words mean one thing, but to support is something they have not seen. There is a phrase, as many of you who are experts know, in the Middle East that says, first the Saudi people, and then the Sunni people. The Saudi people are the Jewish community. In 1948, the Jewish population of Iraq was 150,000. In fact, the finance minister of Iraq was Jewish. When we were there the last time on the trip, when Randall, we were there together, I said, how many Jewish people are left they said maybe 10, it may be as low as four individuals. And in Egypt, you see the same thing. In, in, Egypt, in Egypt, you see the same thing. The Jewish community... In, in Egypt, the Jewish community in 1948 was 80,000. Well, we were there a couple years ago. We met with the leader of the Jewish community. She said, Mr. Wolf, there are 20 of us. We're old, older elderly individuals, and soon we'll all be be gone. And now we understand after a meeting I had yesterday, maybe the Jewish community in Israel is roughly around 10 or 12 in individuals. We see the same thing taking place now to the Christian community in, in, in Iraq. These are my own personal views. We were in Sinjar City. We were in Sinjar Mountain. You may have seen three years ago at this time, the relief that was dropped to the Yazidis that were up on the mountain. We went to Bartella. We went to Karakush, we went to Nimrod. Uh, in the Bible, uh, we saw what ISIS has done to the, to the city of Nimrod. We went to Ur Erbil, we went to Dahuk, and then we went Marty uh, Hudson, God is in, to uh, Mosul. We visited a church in Mosul and talked to, to some of the people. We talked to Christians, we talked to you Yazidis, the Syrian, Chaldean, the Catholic community. We talked to the international community, the UN. We talked to our embassy. We talked to Kurdistan regional government officials. We then went in IDP camps and talked to real people about what was going on in, in their life. There were many, many sad stories. We have a report here. I think there should be enough that everyone can take, but one Christian woman was sold 20 times by ISIS, 20 times. It was painful to even listen. I had to leave the meeting in the middle of the meeting 20 times and now she's almost a prisoner in this one room, not being able to go back to her own own, own community. We, we met with, in, a, in an IDP camp, a Christian from Mosul who said he can't go back. We met with another Christian family. He, he was a lab tech technician. His father was on the floor dying under a blanket, and he's afraid to go back. And yet they want to go back because their faith is very, very strong, but they want to see what will the West do. In every meeting, when we said what would we could do, the number one issue that they asked for, in addition to prayer, was protection. Protection, protection, protection. They wanted security. They wanted to be able to return home. They wanted to be able to have somebody to protect them. They wanted security when they go back. So where are we now? We talked to the Yazidis, and I won't go into it. It's in the report. We went into the, the religious community. We talked to Baba Sharif, the head the religious leader of the Yazidis. We talked to the political leadership of the Yazidis. We talked to everybody that we possibly could. Marty got us into places. Other people there got us into places that, quite frankly, not many other people have seen, except maybe for Dave, Dave Ubik. What are the recommendations in order to save, to save Christianity, and as Bob said, in the cradle of, of Christianity? There are several. One, we need the quick passage of Congressman Smith and Anna Eshoo's bill, H.R. 390. So when the Senate comes back, it quickly passes that. That puts money that's currently available, puts it up front, and gives the State Department and different agencies and AID the ability, the money to do something. Secondly, I think this may be the most important recommendation. Is I believe we need fresh eyes on the target. In 2005, when I went to Iraq with Dan Scanlon, my chief of staff, we were in Tikrit. We were going in a hospital, and we had guys guarding us. And every time they went in a room, they put an AK-47 into the room and into the patients' faces. And finally, I said, this is crazy. We're not doing well here. And I came back and put together the proposal for what they call the Iraq Study Group. It was the Baker-Hamilton Commission. 
we need a, a, an Iraq study group number two made up of maybe people like General Petraeus and General Garner and whoever many others would know to come and look to see what do we do at this moment. And in addition to that, I think you need fresh leadership. I think not that I'm criticizing those that are currently there that have run this program, but if you've been involved in something over and over and over and it hasn't worked, when somebody tells you you have to change it, you're reluctant to change it. And the reason you need fresh eyes, sometimes I'm working on something at home and I can't quite get it right. And my wife will say, well, what about this? And she sees it differently because it's fresh eyes. We need fresh eyes on the target and we need a new leadership top leader, a top leader to come in for a year or two, maybe a retired military general, maybe somebody like that. The State Department knows to work directly with, Se with Secretary Tillerson and the State Department to be their man to do everything he or she can do to save Christianity and the Yazidis there. Next, we need to deal with a security issue. And I think there are people that are smarter than I am, but one of the issues that come up over and over is just put a base here. They said, Mr. Wolf, we have a base here, a training base, training police, training military, right here in Karakush, right here in Bartella, right here on the Nineveh Plains. So to have a U.S. or an international training base where there are Westerners there to train, to train the Iraqis on human rights, on religious freedom, to train them on, on military, to train them on policing, I think that would go a long way, and most of them felt that that would go a long way too. Number four is I think we need to hire some contractors who will go out beyond the wire to go into the villages and go. This is not meant as criticism of the American embassy because there was an attack on the American embassy. You may remember there was a bomb that was set off there. But the American embassy is locked down for security reasons. The American embassy only goes to the hotel to meet delegations. Well, the American embassy only goes to the, US, the UN compound. You need to go out beyond the wire. And so I think to have contractors, perhaps retired military, who understand, who are willing to go out and have a, a big force equipment, don't need the, uh, the bulletproof cars, don't need the chase cars, are willing to go in among the people to find out what is needed. I remember Dr. Graham, Franklin Graham, put, put an event on a couple of months ago with persecuted people from all over the world. And the number one thing they said is, be with us, come be with us, eat with us, drink tea with us, listen to us, find out what we're thinking. And so you can't be in an embassy in Baghdad or a consular in Erbil or somewhere in Washington. You have to be out among the people. That's why Samaritan's Purse and World Vision and many other groups do such a good job because they're with the people. So I think we need some contractors who will go out beyond the wire and go and be with the people and come back and be the eyes with the recommendations as to what we, we do. Next, I think it's an opportunity to put influence, to use our influence on the KRG to respect human rights and religious freedom and to do some things that they're not, not doing. I'm sympathetic to the Kurds to a certain degree, but there's some things they're not doing and they're not doing very well in these areas. And we have more power at this time to, exert, to, to influence them, if you will, to do certain things. So I think we should use that, that opportunity. We are very appreciative of the Kurds. The Kurds lost 1,700 people fighting ISIS. The Kurds had 10,000 men wounded. So I have great, I'm thankful for the Kurds and what they've done. But there's an opportunity to make sure they respect human rights and religious freedom, Christians and, 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 and Yazidis. Next, I didn't know this very much. Almost all the meetings we went to, people talked about the land bridge or the Iranian crescent. Iran, we would go through checkpoints, and it would be by Iranian uh, uh, militias, some paid for by the Iranian government. Iran is trying to get our land bridge to go from Iran through Iraq and Baghdad right now is heavily Shia and go from there into Syria and we know that Hezbollah and Iran is working with the side and from there to go to a Mediterranean port. That way you can bring men and supplies and weapons and equipment from Tehran into Iraq, into Syria, into to, to the Mediterranean, to Hezbollah, 
putting, I believe, a direct threat against Israel, but also a direct threat against the Western government and a direct threat against our, our own government. The last recommendation is the different groups need to come together. When you sit down with them, sometimes they have differences of opinions. And as the Bible said, two are better than one. When one falls down, the other can help up. The Christians and the Yazidis and the other religious minorities need to come together with a unified positions, not on everything, but on some fundamental things. And then the diaspora, which is here in the United States and other, other places, needs to be with those who are on the ground. But there needs to be a unity on some of the more fundamental issues. The last thing, and then I'm going to share some quick slides if Dave, Dave can do this. I am both optimistic and I am pessimistic. There were a lot of people heading home. I love my home. I love to get to my own house. They were heading home. You can see the trucks. I don't know if we're going to have any slides, but the trucks on the roads with furniture piled high, going back to Karakush, going back to Bartella. Not too many gone back to Mosul, but going back to other, other places. So if we in the United States do some bold things, if we bring in some new leadership, if we get the new AID director, Mark Green, who's a fine guy, to begin to fund, if there's an office of special coordinator to kind of tie up to make sure the World Vision is working with the right groups and Samaritan's Purse, I think we can literally save Christianity in the cradle of Christendom and in the process also help the Yazidis to save the Yazidis to be able to live in, in peace. If we don't do this, I believe, and this is the controversial part, I believe if we do not do this by the end of this year, I think we will have seen the end because that every group we met with, every group we met with was always thinking of going abroad. They said they're getting calls from the relatives in Australia and in Canada saying, hey, life is good. Come on out. And with the Christian community, with the Christian community, education is very, very important. So when school ends, they're going to leave. And so now they're looking to see what does the United States do. So by being bold, putting new leadership in, passing Chris Smith and Anna Eshoo's bill, putting the things in with regard to protection, a training base, and things like that, I believe we can save Christianity and the cradle of Christianity. And so the message is to, to the church. Many of the Christians feel they feel they've been forgotten by the church in, in the West. As we talk about refugees helping, it is important that we help those who want to stay also. It's fine to help a refugee that comes here. That's what this country does well. But let us also help the refugees that want to stay so that we can save Christianity in the cradle of Christendom so that they'll be there for years and years to come. I think it's good for them. I think it's good for the West. And I think it's the right thing to do. There are many passages in the Bible where Jesus tells us over and over and over what the obligations are. And I think we in the church in the West ought to be in the leadership to provide that with a new administration. I think we have that opportunity. David, you would just run through these quickly. That's, go ahead. Keep going. That's target. target. This is St. Mary's Church in Karakush. These were Bibles that were all burned. Uh, go ahead, David. That was a statue that was broken apart. Every place there was a religious symbol, they hacked it apart. They broke ISIS symbols on all the church symbols. Every cross you'll see, they broke off. Even the, cro even the crosses that were in the concrete, they chipped apart. This was a direct confrontation against Christianity. This is in the church of St. Saint, Saint, Saint Mary's. You see the, des the destruction there. Go ahead, Dave. This is the St. George Church of Bartella. Here you see the cross again, uh, symbols of Target. They used Target practice in that church for a second. They used it as lineup. They shot. They stood way back in the courtyard, and they fired, and they used that as Target, target practice. That's where Sister Diana, who was here, Bob had here about a year ago. That was her church. That was her convent. This is the ISIS banner that hung in Bartella in Iraq, which was a Christian city. This was a church we visited in Mosul. Uh, this was a Muslim family. There were several Muslim families that were living in that Christian Christian church. 
uh, they were glad America was here and doing what to do. This is uh, Old Testament, ancient Nim Nimrod. If you go on YouTube, you can see when ISIS blew it up, they then put it on, and you can see them blowing it, it, it up. It destroyed, uh, that was the tree of life, and all of this goes back. This is an Old Testament Assyrian king in 2 Kings. It's all there. You'll see in the next slide. We can go to the next slide. This was, was his summer castle, if you will. The biblical history there is so rich. This is in Sinjar City where all the Yazidis left. And as they were coming up, the mountain's clothing was all, all over. And that was put up by somebody. But almost nobody has returned to Sinjar. This is ruins of, uh, uh, this is in Sinjar City. In Sinjar City, underneath all of the, of the homes, there are tunnels. Uh, we went into some tunnels that ISIS had. Uh, but Sinjar City, which was a, a Yazidi city, this is a Yazidi family returning home. This is Sinjar Mountain, beautiful, but you can see maybe you can and cannot clothing all over. Most of the families are now living on top of Sindra Mountain, which gets very cold in the winter, but they live in tents and they're waiting for relief, they're waiting for help. Uh, this was bombing and destruction, you can see going up the road, they fled out of the city, and with regard to that, thank you very much for coming. Bob, thank you. Dave Eubank, you have done amazing, amazing things. Then we'll have some questions, but I'm Dave Eubank. Dave? Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Red, blue, green, post. Wherever you're at. I'm Dave Eubank. I'm with the Free Burma Rangers. Last 20 plus years, we've been working in Burma in the conflict areas. We have 70 ethnic relief teams there. But the last three years, we're invited into Iraq and Syria to help people under attack by ISIS. So tonight, uh, mostly I want to give glory to God and thank God that Amen. he changes hearts. That is the best policy of all, and it's a supernatural one, and that is what's going to change the Middle East. It's what changes Amen. us. And he did two Jesus. things for me that is sure. He changed my heart to love the Iraqis. I didn't even know who they were. I was a soldier, ranger, special forces officer, and I fell in love with the Iraqis. That is the power of Jesus. Second, I don't hate ISIS. Um, I got shot there, some of my best friends were killed there, my translator was killed, I saw many children shot in the head, some people I held in my arms and they were shot in my arms, and I don't hate them, I don't hate ISIS, I can pray for them, and that is Jesus only, that wasn't me. So that's, if I can say nothing else tonight, that's what's going to change, and that's what has changed the world. But I'm doing none of this alone, we bring our medics and other people from Burma to help, and I want to say that the U.S. government has done a great job with air support and supporting the Iraqis. Our, um, the Iraqi army itself is very brave, paid a high cost, and my family goes with me. And you guys come on up. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Suzanne. I just turned 15. And when we go on our mission trips, I help my mom with her kids program, and I help give food and water. And when we're in Burma, I help lead the horse and mule teams. Hello, my name is Peter Eubank, and I'm 11 years old. And when I'm on the mission trips with my family, my mom started a Good Life Club program, which is an organi organization to help children. And I help her with that. Hi, my name is Sahili. I'm 16 years old, and I'm an assistant videographer in Kurdistan, Iraq, and Syria. And in Burma, I help lead the horse and mule teams with Suzanne, because that's the only way you can transport food and medicine we need to give to the surrounding villages. Thank you all for coming. I'm Karen Eubank, and just thankful to be here with you all. It's so encouraging to be on the field in a place that's desperate but very rich in a different kind of way and uh, to go through the joys and trials with people there and then to come back and find that you're not alone and you all care about this and are so interested and there's so many amazing, dedicated, competent people working on behalf of them uh, in amazing ways through our government and through the whole population and the community of churches and friends alike. 
The kids program that they're talking about is just called the Good Life Club. And in a nutshell, that's been inspiring to me as well because in the beginning of our time in Burma, I was faced with this group of kids, a whole village of kids in a desperate situation. And I thought, Lord, I can't take care of all these kids. I, I couldn't even take care of one of them. And Jesus said, you're right. Introduce them to me and I'll give them abundant life. And so that's been a real mainstay for my life is to offer that introduction because I don't know what Jesus can do in people's lives. But it's not just true for the kids in Burma. It's true for my friends here as well because we all have difficulties we're going through. And we all want something abundant. So the kids program works itself out into songs and games and skits and lots of fun things that would just give them tools for courage in their body and spirit. And uh, so we have lots of people that join with us and we're never alone. So thank you again for being with us tonight and for all you do as you leave this place um, tonight and in the future. So. We, we go as a family since they've been born, and the people in Burma would say, as soon as our kids are born, bring them to, with us. And you know, there's families in every conflict area. And when I first went to Kurdistan with my kids, the Kurdish defense minister said, oh, you brought your kids, your most precious thing. We'll give you our most precious thing, our country. And that's been true in Sudan, it's been true in Burma, because we're all in this world together, everybody counts. And so they generally, we try to keep them out of direct fire, and back where people are fleeing, but where they can help. But they've been a great blessing. And I, this is not really what I planned to do. I hope it's OK. But why don't you come here, honey? When we were in, we first got involved in Kurdistan about three years ago when we were invited there. And at that point, if you all remember, ISIS had been stopped about 23 kilometers from Erbil. They were pushed up in right below Sinjar. They actually had 90% of Sinjar town. And so my family would be up on the hill, and I'd be down at the front line with my medics. And up in another place called Bashika, there's a monastery, Marmati, St. Matthew's Monastery, since 400 AD. And there was a village below it, and about a mile in front was ISIS. You could see their flags, and they'd shell and shoot, and the Kurds were holding them back. But the Christian monastery is up on this hill. We were there also. And on one Sunday, we walked up the hill to the monastery, and after church, which is Syrian Orthodox, a woman was singing this song and it was a beautiful song and so I videotaped it and my daughter learned it on a trip to Syria which is another story and it's in Arabic but the words are this Jesus set me free Jesus set me free he gave his life for me Jesus set me free and I want Saheli to sing in Arabic because the congressman's talking about these are some of the last Christians left in the Middle East and this woman's singing this and we're are there for the Christians, we're there for the Muslims, we're there for everybody. But this is our family that's there. And so I would like you to sing that song, honey.
So while we were first with the Kurds, and then when the Kurds started the counterattack against ISIS in October of last year, we were with them as well, and they pushed out and made a new de facto border, and the referendum is going to be following up on that, and I agree with the congressman. This is a good time to show our support to the Kurds. They have a right to their own country. However, they need to take the time to include everybody. And Christians and Yazidis are very much caught in the middle between the Iraqis and the Kurds right now. So I think we have a good position as friends with the Kurds to thank them and support them, but also encourage them to take the steps necessary, not only for the freedom for the Christians and Yazidis, but for good relations with the Iraqis. The, as we were in Kurdistan, ISIS was defeated by November in Kurdistan. And we felt God opened a door for us to help the Iraqis. And like I told you, my heart was changed working with the Iraqis. Starting in Mosul in November, all the way till June, we were with them. And our job was my wife and kids would be back at the Kazi collection point, handing out food and water or taking care of patients. And myself and my team were at the front. And we faced ISIS a lot. In, the, in that time. We started, the brigade I supported started with 105 BMPs, that's armored track vehicle, with about a 10-man crew. We had eight when the battle was over. And we lost almost all our tanks. One of the battalions I was with at the end of this mission, which was June, but two months ago, we had 27 men left. And that is the price the Iraqi army has paid. The Americans are providing air support, but all the hard fighting is done by the Iraqis, and they're brave. And one thing that struck me the most about the Iraqis, these are mostly Shia soldiers, they'd risk their lives to save Sunni families who were running. Mostly Sunni families at the end were ISIS families. And I asked them, why did you give your life? And some of them died saving other uh, Sunni families. They said, if we don't save them, we'll be fighting forever in Iraq. And so one thing we've tried to encourage our government, the US government to do, is stay close to the Iraqi army. They know the cost. They have, I think, the right idea how to go forward. While we were there, we saw ISIS killing families, maybe a family or two a week inadvertently. But by June of this year, they began a slaughter of families. And a fatwa came out from the, from the ISIS, especially the Chechen ISIS from Russia. These are Muslims from Russia who came and joined. Very sophisticated, very good at what they're doing. Anti-aircraft systems, anti-tank systems. They were on the first bridge in northwest Mosul, wiping out anybody who tried to come. But when families began to leave, they sent out a fatwa, which was this. Any family that leaves, even your own child, kill them. Don't let them fall in the hands of the Iraqis. And so I, I want to show you a, a clip. We, we were helping people. You got rescue one, honey? You all may have seen this, but this is... Stop. Pause for a second, honey. All right. On this street, there's about 70 dead people. These are all dead bodies. And, then we, and we saw this, and there was about one, one or two little kids still alive, hiding in their parents' mother's hijab, the black covering. And we saw one man alive. And we prayed, how can we help them? Because this street was totally tr controlled by ISIS. And they'd already destroyed armored vehicles and many, many people. And we prayed, and I contacted the Americans. I'm an ex-Special Forces guy. There's a few of y'all in here. Thank God for our military. Anybody doubts the courage of our military? You know, courage isn't just facing bullets. For a lot of us, that'd be the easy thing. It's risking your reputation and your job, isn't it? That's the tough one. <laughs> and talking to this American general, he said, okay, talk to the, the, the Kurds, because we got, I mean, the Iraqis, we've got to do this right. So the Iraqis and Americans coordinated. They dropped this smoke, 93 rounds of smoke. ISIS is right behind this wall on, on higher buildings. And then an Iraqi tank crew volunteered, one of them, to go out. These are two volunteers that came with us. And my, the guy who filmed this is a, from Burma, my pastor named Monkey, and he's filming this whole thing. I'm running out to get this girl. Okay. So we got that girl out. And you can, you can stop running. We got that girl out and go to Dragon Mama. We got that girl out. That was, I believe, the power of God. That was the Americans dropping smoke when we needed it. It was the Iraqi tank risking their life to go help and, and our team helping. After that, we got that girl out and we went back to Kazi Collection Point. I called my wife and said, honey, I got a little kid, the only one not shot. 
but she can't speak. She's been hiding under her dead mother. I, she's going to need a mom. So after we've given her an IV and given her a lot of water, we handed over to Karen. I just found out this week that she'd been reunited with the only living member of her family, an aunt. And it's the first time I saw her smile. I'm sorry I don't have the photo of her smiling, but she's okay. But the next day, in the same ISIS compound, but now in more in their area, we were told there's more people alive and a woman who's been shot in the hip and has a compound fracture, saw through the cracks outside where you rescued that girl, said, please rescue me. There's five of us here alive. And I was like, no way. We cannot get inside their compound, inside ISIS compound, and get anybody out, we'll all die. And in Iraqi, so I want to make this point really clear. The first day, God's power, the American smoke, and the Iraqi tank, I made the plan, I led the mission. The second day, an Iraqi private named Zuhair, he made the plan, he led it. In fact, he told me when I was terrified, that's the only word I could choose, I ain't gonna go there, man. We're all gonna die. And he said, I will go by myself and die. I will not leave anyone alive in there. He said, you're special forces, you guys can do anything. I was like, man, this ain't a movie. <laughs> but um, I'm also 56, I can't do like kung fu flips or anything. So. But we prayed. And one thing I loved about the Iraqis, everyone I met, they believe in God. And so we could pray together. Him a Muslim, me a Christian, and say, God, what should we do? Well, the Iraqi army wouldn't let him go. And we prayed again, and the Iraqi commander said, okay, you get eight hours off. Anybody wants free time, eight hours. And so one lieutenant, two sergeants, subordinated himself to this private, and so did I. And four of my team, we went, and we were pulling people out. And ISIS is very close to us. And I know this is not probably supposed to be a religious talk. I don't know how else to say it. But we're inside an ISIS building. You can hear them talking outside. There's 200 of them. These are Chechens. With ZSU 23s, anti-tank, machine guns, everything. And it's a blown up Pepsi factory, so there's a lot of noise. And I thought, oh God, you gotta be kidding me. But that's when I remembered the power of prayer. And I know people like y'all are praying. And so I said, in Jesus' name, ISIS, you can't hear us. Demons must be stopped. Satan, get away. We gotta do this. And I did it on a shred of faith. And we went in there, we rescued four people, and then there was a woman right there, she's behind a truck, and with four other shot people, or third day, she's been shot, no water, three days. And she looked at me and said, with just her mouth, because she couldn't make a noise, help me. And I thought, no way. If we step out there, the four people are trying to say, they're gonna die, we're all gonna die. And I, but then I prayed, and remembered God could do anything. And I wanna say this, God can do everything, anything, including what needs to be done, sir, about U.S. policy. Even though people may tell us, no, 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 we can't do this. If God's in it, it can be done. And, and so I just prayed, Lord, help us. And I prayed with Zuhair, and he looked up, and he looked at the wiring, and he said, Bleh. we couldn't make noise. We cut the wiring down, we tied it. There's a little girl, she ran it out 20 meters, ice is shooting at her, because they could see her, threw it to this lady, she tied her on her wrist, and the way her angle was, ISIS couldn't hit her and they can't see her, so go ahead and show that. So we're just dragging her. All these are dead bodies. This guy in a wheelchair dead right there, shot. As we got her closer, she's saying, God is great, thank you, God, and thank you, you guys didn't leave me. So, okay, that's good, honey. So, that was our, I don't know how you count rescues, but we ended up doing seven of them. And some journalist asked me, do you guys specialize in rescues? I said, no way, man. You don't want to do a real one because you're probably going to die. And, but that couldn't have been done without the Iraqis. And the Iraqi general we worked with, General Mustafa, the day I left was, was in June. He said this to me. He's a Muslim. And first he made fun of us. The first week was I had a hard time. And he's looking at us all the time like, who are you guys, you know? He'd worked under Saddam Hussein. He was a Sunni general. And he said, tell the Americans, we love you. Please love us. And I want to thank you for showing us what it means to follow Jesus. You've, you're willing to give your life for us Iraqis. We'll do the same for you. And we watched them do that. So when, I, when um, Congressman um, Wolf talked about fresh eyes, I believe that's, a, that's what we need. We need, there's great eyes out there and our military's done a great job, but we need fresh, aggressive, loving eyes. Uh, I don't know, with someone who could coordinate all these activities and say, we're gonna, we're gonna be there in the Middle East. We have no choice. We can run back here and hide. That would be wrong. One, it won't work. They will come to us. 
Second, what a waste of our life. God's given us so much. We're not going to lose happiness helping those people. And so, and we can do it. It's possible. We can't solve every problem, but we can do some things. And so one thing I like, Colonel North told me, Oliver North the other day, he said, Dave, we want to cooperate, not dominate. But to cooperate, you've got to be there, as you said, sir. And so whoever these new guys are, which some of you all may be able to think about, could lead the effort to be one with these Iraqis and maybe even Syria. We may have to do both of these. The another initiative you talked about was contractors. And I think the issue there was many people in our government don't have the freedom to go out and, and be with these people. And if you're not with those people, you don't know them. You're not going to care as much. You're probably going to be more afraid. Once you're with somebody, your fear kind of goes away. You start loving somebody. I always tell my teams, if you're afraid, ask God for love because you're not going to be afraid with love. You don't have to think you're a hero. You're going to do heroic things out of love. So if our government and my, this is my real thing, sir, I think our president, it's got to come from the president. The only way you're going to change the policy if the president of the United States says, okay, from now on, you at every embassy and every military installation, you will decide your own risk assessment and you will go out and meet people. And if you get killed or one of your guys gets killed, we're not going to fire anybody. It's going to, Buck's going to stop with me. We're going to engage. And that's where I think it needs to come from. Otherwise, the biggest fear, I think, isn't people are afraid people are going to die. People are afraid to lose their jobs. That's my, my, my feeling. And so we, if that doesn't happen, then we're going to have to have contractors or somebody who can go out and engage. In the meantime, there's people like Samaritan's Purse. There's many NGOs that work behind the front line or near the front line, some in the front line. They'll be very happy, I know we would, to have a direct line of engagement with our government to help any way we could. We can't do the powerful things the American government can do but we can help. So I agree with that. The Hashi Shabi, I'm trying to follow your outline, sir. The Hashi Shabi or uh, the militias that have stood up, I think in one sense, they're like any militias that would grow up in America if we were overrun, there'd be some good ones, there'd be some bad ones. We, we work only with the good ones by the grace of God. I always approach them like this. God sent me, number two, I'm an American. Number three, sorry for anything wrong we've done to your country. We're here at your service. I always became friends with them. And so there's many of these militia that could be our friends. However, just as if we had a militia situation in America, there'd be some that'd be downright evil. And if you had a foreign influence like Iran, they wouldn't just be evil, they would have an agenda to drive. And we, if we think we should be invested in Iraq, they know they have to be. And so right now, it's an unavoidable contest. And I don't think it needs to be one that you've got to win with bullets. I think you're going to win it with love. But you can't have love without presence. And so I want to support you, sir, in all your um, suggestions. And I think I, I would like to stop here, except, I, I, except for one little story. My drive, one of my drivers in, in the Humvee I had was a, was a Muslim named Muhammad. In April, he gave his life to Jesus. The next day, he went to Samaritan's First Hospital. He said, oh, there's lots of these Jesus people here. And... A month after that, in May, on May the 4th of this year, the unit I was with launched an attack in northwest Mosul, and we ran into a buzzsaw. We lost four BMPs right away. We lost two tanks, 30 guys killed. Civilians start running. ISIS starts gunning them down. We try to help the civilians. Our guys start getting shot. My Humvee got shot to pieces till I couldn't even move. Lost power, transmission. The guy in the machine gun hatch had to come inside. And my driver, Mohammed, said, I'll go for help. I said, no way, man. Let's get a tank in here to help us. He jumped out, ran through a hail of fire, a real hail of fire, got another Humvee, came back. Meanwhile, there was civilians who'd been shot. We pulled them into our Humvee. One little girl, about nine years old, shot in the eye. Her father shot twice, shot again as I lifted him up. He's bleeding to death. We were trying to stop the bleeding. My medics are inside the Humvee. Humvee can't move. We're in between three buildings. They're firing us up. Muhammad drives back to the new Humvee, parks on the safe side. But in the meantime, ISIS has moved around that site. They're closing in for the kill. And Muhammad jumps out of, my, out of his new Humvee. Our Humvee door opens. My translator, Jaheen, steps out. Some of you all know, like Chris, you met him. He was shot dead. Not, he didn't die at the minute. He shot in the stomach, fell down. We couldn't transload the, the wounded people. Muhammad grabbed Shaheen and was shot eight times. This is the new Christian. Eight times. One, two, three, four. M16. Uh, how he lived, I don't know. Five, six, seven, eight. Did not fall down. Picked up Shaheen, drug him into the Humvee, and if there's a word, greater love hath no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friends, it's that. Because here's a Muslim, well, he was a Muslim. Here's an Iraqi helping a Yazidi. Shaheen was a Yazidi. And actually, Shaheen hated the Iraqis. And he 
gave his life, though, that day to save Iraqi family members. Shaheen died 10 days later in the hospital, my, my translator, the Yazidi guy. Muhammad, I called two weeks later. We were, that, that was at 10 o'clock in the morning. That was the beginning of the battle. Well, I've got to finish the story. We finally got a tank down to us, blasted away at ISIS, pulled our vehicle out. That was 10 in the morning. That was the beginning of the day. It just kept going on and on and on until we left in June. But two weeks later, I called Muhammad. I said, Muhammad, how are you? He's in the hospital in Baghdad. He said, I'm very happy. I said, how are you happy, man? He said, Jesus in my heart. And so what I found, you know, I prayed that would happen. And I haven't seen it happening in droves, but that's God's business. A friend of mine reminded me, don't be mission focused, be kingdom focused. It's God's business. But I've learned to love the Muslim Iraqis. And I haven't told you about Syria. We've been there a couple times. But I think I'm going to stop right now um, for questions for the congressman or for myself or comments. But thanks for listening. And it's co-sponsored by Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey, a Republican, and Anna Eshoo, a Democrat from California. Uh, and if there's any way that these messages that you've given tonight can work their way up to the top of our government, our Congress needs to hear what you just said, and it has to make its way to the President. Well, both Dave and I went up today and briefed staff up on the Hill. As you know, most members are back in their districts now. their flocks, their respective flocks, Orthodox or Chaldean or Catholic or whatever, to leave and to leave permanently rather than stay? No, I don't think that's true. Uh, one priest that we met with on the first trip said, help us to stay. But if you're not going to help us to stay, then help us to leave. Don't leave us in this. But no, they desperately, Bishop Werda and all the priests that we met with and the nuns, they want their people to stay. They love their country. It is a beautiful country. The history, you know, so no. They, but the comment was, which I thought was very profound, help us to stay, but if you're not going to help us to stay, then help us to leave. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's accepted that Israel is home for Jews. In many countries in the Muslim world, like Saudi Arabia, it's, it's a Muslim country. Why can't we, for example, have a place like Lebanon, you know, a place where a safe haven for Christians to come to, maybe? Well, the Christians in Iraq love their country. They, they, they want to stay. And so they don't, I mean, some have moved to Lebanon as a way of getting out of danger, but they want to stay. They love their country. Uh, some of the home, they're highly educated. Uh, a number of them are doctors. Uh, the one gentleman, we were in a tent, he was a, a, a PhD uh, in Mosul at the Uno University. Uh, the other one in another tent was a, was a lab technician in the hospital in Mosul. But they want to stay. They love their country the same way that if we're from you know, the Shenandoah Valley, we love the Shenandoah Valley, so they want to stay. But their frustration is they have not seen the West really do what it said it can do to help them, them stay. But they, they love their country and they want to stay. So thank you very much. Uh, do you have thoughts on how to wake up the church to uh, the needs of Christian nutritions in Iraq and other places? Uh, I'll do the first part, sir. Prayer. 
because the only thing that's going to last is a, a spiritual impulse, not a human impulse. The second is, I would say, be bold. Bold in things of Jesus, humble in things of humans. And go for it. There's nowhere in the Bible that I can read that says be safe, hold back. This is the line, you can't cross it. It's always go. Go forth to all the nations. Be bold. And so God has blessed our country so much, and it's, I believe we'll keep blessing it. We obey him and keep going. And so I, my message to the church is, ask God what to do. He's going to tell you. Well, I think there is a way, because we have a model. It was in the late uh, 1997, 98, Chuck Colson, and I wish we had Chuck alive today, but Chuck Colson, Cardinal McCurrick, uh, Rabbi Saperstein, David Saperstein, who was the religious ambassador in the previous administration, did an outstanding job. They all came together, and it was a group that met to deal with the issue of Sudan. Many churches in those times, in the month of November, would have a, a, a Religious Freedom Sunday. They would bring in dissidents from China, from Sudan. And the church was alive on fire, if you recall. For some reason, it's dissipated. And so I think there is a way... There are so many passages in the Bible telling the church what they're going to do. To stand with your brother in Christ. Those who are in prison as your purpose. Look for and read about it. But I think it needs to be. And so we don't have a Colson. We don't have Cardinal McCurry. Bishop World has been very good. Cardinal Dalton has been very good. Russell Moore has been very good. But if every church had a Sunday where they prayed for the persecuted church, and brought in people from China, brought in people from Sudan, brought in people from Iraq. And, and, and secondly, adopt uh, churches and adopt uh, Christian communities and, and, and families in these places. I think we'll wake up the church, but last good prayer. But it, it was done. There was such a powerful movement. That's how the Religious Freedom Bill passed. Chuck Colson used to do breakpoints. Carl McCurry would do things. Rabbi Saperstein. It all dissipated in the, in the mid, you know, 2004, 2005, and six. I think it can be rekindled. Uh, Frank, can I speak to that too, just real quickly? Okay. We, uh, I appreciate that question. My wife and I were in Izmir, Turkey, three and a half years ago, and we were sitting at a table with a pastor from Syria, and he said, uh, "They're killing our men, they're raping our women, they're burning our churches, and the church in the West doesn't care why." Well, I was pastor of a church in Texas. I, I'd rather be pastor than anything. I, was, I love the church. It's a great church. But God moved in our heart that we need to do something. What, how can you wake up the church in America? And that's that's the motivation for me to leave and start Willow Force was how do we wake up the church in America? And let me just give you a resource. Uh, the, the Baptist churches in Texas asked us to provide resources for them. So the weekend of November uh, 3rd, 4th, and 5th, they're trying to get all their churches, 5,500 churches, Try to get all their churches to emphasize standing with the persecuted church on that Sunday. And so Dave Eubanks and his family are going to be with us in Texas. But we've created a website that will be live next week. It's live now, but we're still popular. It'll be ready next week. It's Speak Freedom Texas. It has nothing to do with geography. It's just that they're the ones that was a reason that they're the ones who asked us for this. And on speakfreedomtexas.org, we have sample sermons, and so you, you can think of one of these sermons and anglicize them and, and our, our capitalize them or whatever, but you, we have four sample sermons. Uh, we have 25 illustrations of, of people that we've met that are in these persecuted churches, uh, persecuted areas, uh, and, and, and most of them are, are Christians, but we have some that are Muslims that are facing religious persecution. We have videos that can be used. We have Sunday school lessons that can be used. Uh, we have prayer guides. We have a prayer guide for children. Uh, children's prayer guide so they know how to pray for the Christian church. And then we have some very specific things that your church can do. We even have a little thing called Build Freedom Shelter where uh, Habitat Humanity asked us to give an example of a shelter that they live in in these IDP camps. And so we get exact stats of a shelter in Nigeria. And so a church can build this little shelter. They're doing it. Some of them have done it. It costs $200 to build. And then we, we populate it with, with storyboarding on the inside. And then the children go through, all these different ones go through these houses and, and have them really visualize what whole families are living in in a lot of these 90 feet camps. So that, that's a resource, and we hope that, you know, people, you know, regardless of where they live or what their denomination is, might, might find that's a helpful resource. Okay, up here. Could you uh, give a few uh, 
your thoughts on cooperation with uh, the Greek Orthodox, the Lebanese Orthodox, the Ukrainians, the Serbs, the Russians, the Orthodox, as, as <laughs> your thoughts, because they're, they're powerful in large All the numbers. numbers. Yeah. Yeah. But what, what, in fact, is happening? I don't know the answer to that at all. That's why I was trying to hand the mic over to you, sir. I think it's a great idea, but you're going to be better at this than me. Well, there are. What the Orthodox Church is active uh, with regard to some in Greece and some in that. But I think everyone really ought to be about uh, Franklin Graham did a very powerful program in, in July. He was at the Mayflower. He brought in Greek Orthodox, every denomination. Every denomination, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, and they all came to Washington. There were four to five hundred people. It was the first summit they've ever had. And they all told, told the story. So there was the beginning of the cooperation. And Franklin Graham, now I assume they're going to do another one, but they were all there from Russia. The Patriarch, if there's anybody there, the Patriarch was there from Russia. Uh, uh, Cardinal Worrell was there. Cardinal Worrell spoke. Uh, I think Russell Moore was there from the Southern Baptist. Everyone was there, and it was in July of this year. So a lot is being done, and Franklin Graham pulled that group together. Didn't get very much press, but they were all, all there. They took the whole group to tell. That's so many, I think five to 700 people from 130 some countries around the world. I, if I may just make this comment, uh, Frank, the um, Westminster Institute, of course, we're housed here with Barnabas Aid, which is an organization that helps persecuted Christians and is also in the field in some of these places, brought together a group of bishops and ministers uh, from the Middle East, particularly Iraq and Syria, to, to work on the kind of cooperation we're talking about, and the biggest problem they faced, you, you just touched upon, in Franklin Graham's gathering, that they didn't get much publicity. And one of the messages to these bishops and others was to you arrange amongst yourselves to raise the profile of what you're going through uh, so that it does get that kind of publicity and attention that would call forth a larger response from here. Do you have any? No, I think you have to do that. I was disappointed. I mean, here Franklin Graham, and you know, the hospital, uh, I saw one little thing about the hospital. It was the most impressive thing I've ever seen. They, they, I don't know if Franklin Graham, a Samaritan's person, wants it to be talked a lot, a lot about. You know, you want to do some things and not take credit for them. But they have different programs, different uh, color tapes for different injuries. And one is the black tape for somebody who's dying. No one dies alone. Little children who are dying, they stay with them, they comb their hair, they pray with them, they rub their arms, so when they're dead, they have somebody there. What, what, what Samaritan's Purse is doing in that hospital? <clears throat> I don't think anybody from our government has been in a hospital. It is incredible. And you know, there are no Christians. There are Christian men and women and nurses. There are volunteers from all over America. They're treating everyone who's being treated as a Muslim. And yet, so for some reason, the paper didn't even cover this. It's probably one of the most impressive stories coming out of the region. But, you know, that's why I think all the churches have everything that takes place in culture is downstream to the political process. And I think you've got to get this thing covered, and a politician's got to begin to under understand this, that your churches care, care deeply. But why did Franklin Graham's group get a, every leader? And what Franklin Graham is doing, Google, the hospital that he has, just outside, it's a rough neighborhood, and they've been there for months. And they've gotten just a little, little coverage. Have you been in the hospital? Yes, sir. I, we, when we were fighting in East Mosul, that was the preferred place we take our casualties to. And all the Iraqis called it the American Hospital, where people love you and take care of you. It was the number one place you can get your people there on the east side. And I went there a couple times. I took Muhammad there, and he's like, oh, this is a Jesus place. And that's when he was still a Muslim. So. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, I want to uh, thank Congressman Wolf and Dave Eubank. I must tell you that um, their presentations and, let us say, their characters makes a lot of sense of what an Iraqi said as the American troops began leaving. And an Iraqi was said, well, now that the American troops are leaving, uh, what do you think of them? And his response was, you're better than your movies. <laughs> That's because they met people like Dave Eubank and of course Congressman Wolf, uh, because what they see there that they don't see in the movies is the finest character of, of America and our country. God bless you both. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.